Hello, thank you for joining us for another episode of Coffee Quip, where we have some high-level discussions on market research topics. My name is Greg Pozzola. I'm on the marketing team here at MSG, and I'll be guiding today's discussion a bit. Um, so this is our fifth episode in the series, and when this episode, we're going to be continuing our discussion into hybrid sampling. And once again, on today's panel, we have three members of our customer success team, Elizabeth Nelson, Janet Malafi, and Stephen Dentino. And our subject matter expert today is our chief data scientist, Dr. Mansoor Fahini. So I know we have a lot to get to today. Um, I do want to jump into it, but Mansoor, why don't we, for the people that maybe didn't see the last episode, give us a quick 30 second recap of hybrid at a high level here. Sure. So um, hybrid sampling uh, can be considered as an extension of the composite estimation methodology where we combine survey data from multiple surveys to produce a more robust set of data to report from, uh, except in this case, uh, samples are selected from multiple sampling frames and then blended together uh, for various reasons, including cost savings or uh, when uh, the, the target population is very rare and for feasibility reasons, we need to mix and match samples from different frames. Thank you, Mitsur. Why don't we kick it over to uh, Steve? Steve, you have a question? Uh, yes, um, Mansoor, if you're using an ABS uh, online hybrid approach, would it make sense to have the ABS portion always be pushed to web or should clients still be mailing out surveys as well? That's a very good question. Um, I think uh, the way response rates are declining, we really don't have the luxury of dictating one particular modality. Of course, cost and other considerations may limit us to the, the number of modes of data collection. Uh, however, uh, Push to web has become a very popular strategy for various reasons, again, including for its efficiency in terms of cost and some benefits in terms of the, 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 the fact that for, for socially sensitive surveys, respondents often feel more comfortable responding to the screen rather than being interviewed by, interviewed by a live uh, uh, interviewer. Uh, so the answer to your question is push to web is becoming more and more the choice uh, that survey researchers use, but it doesn't have to be the only choice. We often rely on phone calls or reminder notes or even providing a paper pencil as an option in, in the hopes of increasing response rates. Okay, thank you. So Mansoor, Going back to your calibration question um, comments earlier, if someone is interested in using the calibration method, would they have to include the questions that you suggest just in the online survey or would they in, um, include them in all their surveys, whether it be phone or ABS? Uh, sure. So again, we have to think about calibration as a more comprehensive uh, weighting adjustment. Uh, typically, when we talk about weighting, uh, we are talking about geodemographic adjustments with calibrations that are often applied to samples with representational issues. We go above and beyond geodemographics and we typically include some questions on attitudes, behaviors, or uh, thematic questions related to the survey uh, so that we can make additional adjustments to the respondents that come from um, non-probability sample components. Oftentimes, the needed benchmarks for those calibration adjustments are not available from public sources. Therefore, it is usually the case that we need to include three, four, as many as uh, we, we deem necessary questions that are uh, uh, presented both on the probability-based sample component as well as the non-probability so that the needed benchmarks for calibration will be generated from the probability-based sample component. 
Thank you. Mansoor, in regards to surveys themselves and in today's world, is there an ideal length of interview where um, often there is a lot of information you need to gather, but is there, you know, ideally a creative way to uh, limit that interview to a certain amount of time? And what would you recommend for length of interview? So again, uh, an excellent question, but the answer depends on so many factors. Uh, surveys uh, come with different uh, um, analytical objectives. The, the topic of the survey can be different. The target population can be different. The available budget can be uh, very different. So for all these reasons and some other reasons that I I'm not remembering right now. Uh, length of the survey can vary, but the point is in today's uh, world, uh, again, as response rates continue to decline, it is very important for our surveys to be as short and sweet as possible so that we minimize non-response and uh, at the same time improve data quality because as surveys become long and arduous, not only we run the risk of increasing breakoffs or non-response, but also we increase the possibility of poor data quality due to respondents straight lining or uh, speeding through the questionnaire. So it is fair to say that the days of long and arduous surveys are over and surveys need to be as lean and mean as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, one quick call, one quick follow up on that then with what you're saying, I guess an open ended question would be, um, you know, you really would want to limit that to avoid all of the negative things that could that could lead to. Is that correct? You would want to yeah. limit the open ends? Well, this is my personal choice. Um, I, I have never been a fan of open ends. I think a survey that includes uh, lots of open end questions is one that hasn't been tested enough and therefore we are leaving uh, uh, que some questions in an open end format. Open ends are time consuming and uh, they they are also very difficult to to compile and analyze uh, therefore for these reasons and again other reasons it is it is really not a good idea to include open ends unless you have to there is some new topic, new concept that response categories cannot be predetermined. Therefore, you leave it as an open end. And also, it has become somewhat common to use open ends uh, for catching fraudulent respondents. Again, I am not a fan of that, but some uh, researchers use mm -hmm. gibberish open end responses as a flag for uh, fraudulent respondents. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks, Ben. So, yeah, so I'm going to jump in uh, right here. This does seem like a good spot maybe to conclude today's discussion into our hybrid sample. Um, if you have any more questions or want to learn any more about this product, feel free to contact us directly. Janet, Elizabeth, and Steve are standing by ready to help you with your next project. So, again, thank you to our panel. Thank you, Dr. Fahimi, for joining us again today. And thank you to everyone who stopped by, and we will see you in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks. Okay.